الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبيه الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Welcome to our seminar. I'm so excited. Uh, many of you are already on the journey or going in the next few days, and I'll be joining you all in about a week. So this is a very important session. Uh, we are not talking today about logistics or about the monastic of Hajj. I wanted to do this session to talk about some medical issues and, and diseases and problems that happen in the Hajj so we can prepare ourselves mentally and physically. Um, so... And I'm going to do this. There's no formal presentation. I'm going to speak about specific items, and we're going to open. Uh, feel free to jump in at any point and ask your questions. But generally, what we're going to do is I'm going to discuss the common things that happen in Hajj for everyone, even people without any medical condition. Um, so we'll talk about um, a little bit about the feet. We'll talk about the skin. We'll talk about hydration and infections. These are the main things that happen. And then second half, we'll talk about specifically people with diabetes and high blood pressure and specific diseases, what some of the things they need to be aware of and things like that. So before we begin, uh, just be careful about the WhatsApp group. There's a lot of scams going on in WhatsApp. Anyone calls you asking for a code, asking for money, or asking for you to click anything is always a scam. So hang up immediately, report them, block their number. Uh, none of us will ever contact you directly in this way. So be very, very careful. In the last three days, we received many, many calls and the same people are calling everyone in the groups and uh, pretending to be from the administration and pretending there's a Zoom meeting and uh, you need to click anything. In general, anytime you need to download anything or click anything, you have to be very, very careful. Assume that it's a scam or a fraud because uh, you know you already signed up through Nusuk. There's one app and then there's specific... Uh, admins that we know, Dr. Ashraf, Dr. Imar, uh, Amar, and, and others. So please uh, don't uh, give any personal information to anyone who calls you, even if they admit, uh, introduce themselves on behalf of any organization. Just be very, very careful, inshallah. Unfortunately, this is the new reality we live in. Okay. So with that, um, what we want to talk about is, um, let's start with, I guess, the skin. So one of the things about Hajj, you know, it's very hot, it's sunny, it's so uh, bright and sunny there that one of the major problems that we fall into is like sunburn and problems with the skin. So in general, you can you'll see in 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 this in in an area like Arabia, Saudi Arabia, um, during the daytime when the sun is at the peak, everyone sleeps. And people are rarely out, even many of the businesses closed because of the effects of the sun. So to protect ourselves, um, we cannot wear caps in ihram. So it's a unique circumstance we find ourselves. We can't really cover our heads. So um, you can use an umbrella to protect yourself from the sun, like separate from not the umbrella hat, but the umbrella that you hold in your hand. Um, and second thing is for those of us who are more light skin, sunscreen is very, very important. So sunscreen you can buy any type of any brand that has like that's a sunscreen lotion so to you know make sure it's like most of them are non-scented anyway so you're you're okay with them you can put them on your skin before going out uh to protect yourself for those who have issues but those who don't really have issues with the sun um you don't have to worry so much about that so uh the sun and the skin care is important any questions on that um before I move on to the next uh, issue. So I'm pretty much done with the skin, and uh, then I'm going to talk about hydration next. Anyone have questions? Okay, um, so that's the skin. The second thing is about the, the footwear, because there's a lot of walking involved, and I mentioned how many miles and miles of walking with the Tawaf and the Sari, and maybe the buses will break down, and we might need to walk from Muzdalifa to Arafah, for instance, um, so you have to be prepared to do a lot of walking. Now, I already have a video on that, so um, you can watch that video. I'm not going to repeat those points, but just in general, like there are some questions about the footwear. So, you know, you have to realize there are differences of opinion on issues. So in the end, you have to follow one person or one uh, view that you trust. In general, in the Hanafi school, for instance, um, you have to leave the foot exposed, the top of the foot exposed, the bones on the top of the foot, the heel, and the toes. 
So they would recommend like flip-flops. Um, however, uh, the view I follow and the view of many scholars is that you don't necessarily have to have flip-flops. Flip-flops actually are the worst type of shoe to wear in terms of walking from a pod podiatric or medical perspective because imagine walking in foot flip-flops for, for miles at a time. So many people fall into trouble with their feet. If you can do it and you're young, alhamdulillah, but most people will have trouble with their feet. So you can have some modified version of feet. So I'll just, um, the shoe that I'll be wearing is this one now. In Hanafi Skume, some scholars might not allow this because it's covering over the top of the foot. But um, the main issue here here is that the heel needs to be exposed. It needs to be a sandal. Um, there's a hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari I'll share with you with the Prophet ﷺ said, لا تلبسوا القميصة ولا السراويلات ولا العمائم ولا البرانس So he said basically, do not wear the things that you're not allowed to wear. So he said, do not wear, um, you know, the shirts. You cannot wear pants. You cannot wear something on your head like a turban or a cap. Uh, and then he said about the shoes, he specifically, this is what he said. He said, um, إِلَّا إِنْ يَكُونَ أَحَدًا لَيْسَتْ لَهُ نَعْلَانٍ uh, فَلْيَلْبِسْ قُفَّيْنِ وَلْيَقْطَعْ أَسْفَلَ مِنَ الْكَعْبَيْنِ This is hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari. So he said, basically what he was advising people do not to wear shoes, but to wear na'lain, which are sandals. So the Prophet commanded all the companions to wear sandals and not shoes. And he said, except if you cannot find sandals, then you wear your shoes but you cut down the shoes below the ankles, as karbain. That's what he said. So from this hadith, we understand, many scholars understand that main issue is the ankles shouldn't be exposed. So your ankles should not be covered. So based upon that, anything that's below the ankles, so it could be an orthopedic shoe that's uh, like below the ankle, or it could be like an open sandal like this, that generally the ankle is exposed, part of the heel is exposed, the toes are exposed, that should be okay. And then even things like the clog that people put a picture of in this scheme, it would be okay. So again, there would be different opinion on that. But this is uh, an opinion that Sheikh Rasulullah ibn Taymiyyah shared, and it's from Sahih al-Bukhari. That's what I'll be following. So it's very important. Just the ankles and the heels, part of the heels should be exposed. And then for some scholars, the top of the foot and the toes as well. So if you want to be safe, you have no problem, then you wear something that everyone allows. But if you have particular issues and you you follow this opinion, I'm confident that this uh, you can follow this opinion if you like and wear something that has more support for yourself so you'll be able to perform your rights uh, without any disturbance, inshallah. So that's footwear. Uh, we had skincare, footwear. Any questions so far? Just feel free to unmute and then you can ask the questions. We want this to be a conversation and not necessarily a presentation. Okay. Um, the other thing, so if there aren't questions there, then the other issue is, very, very important issue is the issue of hydration, uh, drinking enough water. It's a very hot environment. It's an environment where you're always running around because of running around, you don't have the access to water. You forget to drink water. Plus the heat makes you dehydrate all the time. So whatever water you drink in a normal situation at home, you need to double those requirements generally in a hot environment like Hajj. So drinking water is very, very important. So the reasons people don't bring, drink enough water is one, they're afraid to use the bathroom uh, or they don't want to use the bathroom. So you stop drinking. But what happens is you run into dehydration that causes so many other issues. Um, and many of the issues people have, like throat infections and things like that, part of the reason is dehydration. Your body is dehydrated. Your immune system is not working good. The mucous membranes inside your mouth are very dry. Um, and that causes, like, most of the coughing and throat infections that we uh, we see. So... For that, make sure you drink enough water. Don't worry about using the bathroom. You sh it's better to drink water and use the bathroom frequently, even with long lines, than not drinking enough water. So water is very, very important. One of the things you can do to prepare yourself is, now they sell, they make these hydration packs. So you have this company called Liquid IV. So um, they sell these electrolyte powder packs. So if you use these electrolyte powder packs, 
um, generally, um, you put them in a glass of water, it makes the water much more hydrating. So you have different companies, you have this company, you have Prime is another company. In the US, you can get them from Costco and any store. It's very popular in the summer. So I would recommend if you get a pack of these, so at least maybe you can drink one a day. So even if you're not drinking enough water, at least the water you're drinking uh, is replenishing you and you have enough electrolytes in you. So that's hydration. Hydration is very, very important. There's no restriction to drinking water over there in Ihram or anything. And Zamzam is even better. Zamzam water has healing properties. So try to drink as much Zamzam as you can. If you can bring like a water bottle with you, that way you can fill it up with Zamzam, something like this, and just carry it around with you so you can drink, inshallah. That's very, very important. So those are like key things I wanted to mention, footwear, skincare, hydration. Um, what other issues people have? Now let's hear from you. Um, not talking about diseases like diabetes, but what other issues normal people have in a place like Hajj? Um, Sorry, I just had one question. Yeah. Um, as far as the water, is water just uh, available there or like because my parents are going I just don't want them to carry any excess weight so they I was wondering if they should bring like you know the water canister that you showed or is just you know available so, um, everywhere it's a good question so in the in the masjid water is available everywhere there are coolers everywhere so they've done a wonderful job in every masjid in the Mecca and Medina the Prophet's masjid and the masjid of Haram there are coolers everywhere and the cooler are divided into zamzam and non-zamzam and then there's uh, cold and warm water, like or room temperature water. So those who don't prefer cold water, it's labeled cold or not cold, and um, and then there's cups everywhere. So the the facilities are unbelievable. They're excellent um, everywhere you go. Um, so you don't have to worry about that in the masajid. However, um, in Hajj, we're not just in the masajid. We're also going outdoors in other places. So one of the places we spend time is Mina. My understanding is in, in Mina, generally, they have coolers and they also have arrangements. But you also always have to be prepared because there's a lot of unknowns in Hajj. Like, there's a lot of travel. Um, it could be you're in a situation where you don't have access to water immediately. Um, so, like, when you're walking, for instance, from one place to another, you might not come across a cooler. You might be stuck in a bus for four or five hours and the roads are grid gridlocked and you have nothing to do but stay in the bus. So a lot of the buses, they have coolers and they have water bottles. But suppose the bus we have doesn't. So you always have to prepare for that. In the masjid, in the Makkah hotel, and when you're in the city, you don't have to worry about anything. But I think it's still useful to have something that you can put two or three water bottles in um, and just keep it in your luggage just in case for some of these scenarios, inshallah. Any other questions? Thank you. You're so uh, another thing I forgot in the skincare, skincare very important. I talked about the the um, the sunscreen because of the sun, but the other issue is like when you're wearing ihram, the body parts they rub each other and the skin gets irritated, especially like in the armpits here and in your groin areas because when you're walking, the legs rub uh, to each other and then this happens to women and it happens to men because of the hot environment. So the condition is called either intertrigo. So basically, the whole area in the groin will turn red and it turns into a rash. So that's very common. And for people who are overweight, they might have other full areas where skin touches skin. And in the heat, with the sweat, and we're not allowed to wear underwear for men. Um, so that's a huge issue. So one of the best things you can do for that is something called simple as Vaseline. So you get Vaseline, um, a bottle of Vaseline, and you can rub it. Uh, and Vaseline has no scent. So you can rub it on some of these body parts that I would like at the in your in your groin area between the legs, um, even up here. So you can, if you rub it there, um, then at least there's lubrication and uh, it'll prevent many of these conditions. Now Vaseline is very messy. You can also get on your hands hard to get off. So another great option is you can get this in Target or Walmart. Is this called this Vaseline brand? But it's a body balm. So it's basically Vaseline, but in a stick. Like so, um, so it's a stick. So you can just rub it on without getting it on your hands. So this is a must. <laughs> Everyone should get one of these. 
or two of these and use it uh, in that environment, inshallah. Um, so that's Salaam alaikum, brother. Wa alaikum salam. Go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, uh, once we wear ihram, like, you know, then we not be able to do anything, right? So ihram, there's a number of restrictions in ihram. Once you wear it, uh, it's not about wearing it. It's once you start ihram yeah. at the location where you're going to start ihram. So if you're coming from Makkah, from Medina to Makkah, it will be at Dhul Hulayfa, the, the masjid on the way. If you're going into Jeddah and going straight to Makkah, then it will be before you arrive in Jeddah on the airplane. Or it could be at the transit. So like many of our flights are going to Riyadh, Riyadh to Jeddah. So in the Riyadh, we have two hours at the airport we'll be putting on the ihram, making our intention. So once you pass that miqat, these are specific points around Makkah, that's where the real restrictions of ihram begin. And that's where you won't be able to cut your nails, your hair, and things like that. The whole time you're in ihram until you come out of ihram. So for those doing tamattar, it will be, we like say you're going on the 10th to Makkah. And so if you're doing hajj tamattar, which is umrah and hajj separately, then you're in ihram until you do the umrah. And when you're done with the umrah, two, three hours, then you come out of ihram, then you're back to normal until the the hajj starts. And when we go to Mina on that day, then you put the ihram on again. But there are other types of hajj. So it depends on what type of hajj you're doing. Some people are doing one combined hajj with umrah. Then they are in ihram the entire time. That's uh, ifrad, for instance, or Quran. So it really depends. Yeah, I got you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum yes. I have a question. Okay, so let's just say, right, um, before we do ihram, right? I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Okay. Um, if we shower and we wash our hair and let's say we don't, we use the regular shampoo that has a little scent. Before we made the intention, is that okay? Or I yeah. mean, because before if, you make oh, the intention is okay. Aisha radiallahu anh, she said that she would put scent and perfume on the Prophet before, while well, he's about to get into a haram. So before you get into a haram, you're allowed to do everything. So you're actually the sunnah is to put on perfume, put on scented stuff. So you but do for women that. too? Um, no, not for women. For, for, uh, for, for example, women. like the shampoo or the deodorant, it has some kind of perfume. You you advise the women to use unscented the shower before we uh, we do the intention and everything. Yeah, well, the, the the deodorants and the shampoos, they have the kind of like, it's not really scent. Like scent is where you add, you add this perfume that kind of emits like something like. So these, okay. they have this natural like scented stuff like that's part of the substance of the shampoo. So it doesn't really go out to others. It's not considered perfume. So it would be allowed for, for women to use like deodorants like that. And um, because you'll be wearing clothes, so it doesn't go out. Like the only thing not allowed for women is to put on perfume that attracts other people or other people can smell around them. So, right. But if it's a natural thing, part of perf part of deodorant or part of shampoo, then it would be allowed. Your hair would be covered. There's no way that's coming out of your hair. Okay. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. You mentioned if we do the Umrah separate from the Hajj, inshallah, Hajj Tamato. When we do the second Ihram to start the Hajj, we're already in Mecca. Will there be a way to redo all the ihram processes in mecca like you leave somewhere yeah back so or... you do you do it from the hotel in mecca so you don't have to go out to the place but um the second ihram you do it from the hotel so you would like take a shower in the hotel and you would in the hotel room you put on the ihram and make the intention and you can go out to the you masjid. don't have to go back to the miqat again no you don't go back to the miqat for the second one no so this is hajj good. now you're going to mina it's not like the if you were to do a second Umrah, let's say you had to do, you want to do a second Umrah, just an extra Umrah, then you would go out to the Miqat, like uh, Masjid Aisha, for instance, um, um, and then you put on the Ihram, you come back. But this part of the Hajj, you're going to Mina now, from Makkah, you put on the Ihram there. So we start the Ihram process at the hotel and then embark on the Hajj part. Yes. Jazakallah. Yes. So, footwear, skin care, hydration. What about nutrition? Maybe we can say a word about nutrition. Like, nutrition is important. Um, you don't, like, running around sometimes, you're not eating well. Um, 
So this is a it's, it's a tricky one. Um, it's okay if you skip meals. I mean, we all do that. I mean, everyone in America does that. The latest craze is intermittent fasting. So people are not eating for 16 hours. And and then we do fasting anyway in Ramadan. So not eating for periods of time uh, is not necessarily a problem unless you have a medical condition. But however, when you do eat, you need to eat healthy. So this is very, very important. The problem with the kingdom of Saudi Arabia is like most of the food that's available is fast food. And that's one of the big problems we find as as people are health conscious or doctors, like the worst kind of food is available in, uh, in Umrah. Like you have KFC and all this fast food that is not considered real food in America or in other countries, but that's considered luxury food in, in Mecca and Medina. So there are long lines outside of Starbucks and KFC and McDonald's and Burger King. So that food is highly processed, and that's one of the reasons people get so sick. Um, in terms of almost everyone gets a cold or an infection or flu when they're there. The part of the reason is nutrition. So it's very, very important to eat healthy. So, you know, what can you do? We can do our best by making the right choices. A lot of it is limited by the choices we have. There's no salad bar in Makkah and Medina, unfortunately. There's no, there's no healthy food options. That would be a great business idea. Somebody should remind some of these businessmen that, you know, in, a, in in the other countries, like healthy food options are becoming very profitable. So if there should be one shop in that clock tower where you have salad, there's a salad bar or protein or something like that, or, you know, protein sources. But at least what you can do is if you have buffets in your hotels, right, then they have different options. So at least take a lot of vegetables, take salad, cucumbers are pretty big there. So emphasize whole foods and wholesome foods over processed foods and you'll have much more energy and you'll have more, um, you know, you have less likelihood of, of, of running into problems. So try to make good choices. Try to bring some stuff with you. You can bring protein bars. You can bring, uh, well, dates you will buy. Their dates are excellent. And I think the reason people stay alive there is because of dates. That's the savior of, of that whole area. Because dates are a superfood. It's something that is incredibly packed with nutrition. It's healthy and it prevents many problems. So have a pack of dates with you all the time. And throughout the day, have a few dates here and there. Um, you can bring nuts with you, walnuts and, and uh, almonds and stuff. They're hard to find there, but bring them with you. So you can have them with you. These things are would be very, very good rather than having candy or like, you know, pastries and pure carbs, the kind that you find in those buffets. So be very careful with your food choices. That would be my other um, advice. Okay. Any questions before we move on to diabetes? I had a question just about yeah. food. Um, someone had once mentioned to me just food related illnesses and typhoid and hep A vaccines. Any suggestions? So typhoid and uh, hepatitis A, those are, they're not necessarily food related. They're basically viruses that are spread through contaminated water. So thankfully, that's not a problem in Saudi Arabia. Like it's very rare. Um, the food there is clean. The water is clean. That's alhamdulillah is not a problem. We It's a problem we find in other countries, in Asia, in the subcontinent, maybe in Africa. Um, but alhamdulillah, the plumbing, the water, the food generally is clean. So it's rare. All the years I've been going, rarely have seen a case of food poisoning, for instance, from bad food or or like hepatitis A or things like that. So alhamdulillah, we're relatively safe from that. However, you know, this common sense is always important. If you see food lying around, like if you're not in Makkah, Medina, but you're in like Mina or Arafat, there's food lying around. It looks like it's been there for a while. It's bad. Try to avoid that. Try to eat fresh food. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Um, I was going to ask if we are going to make a haram in at the airport, can we just shower at home, trim our uh, cut our nails and hair, and uh, make the intention, or which should we? Which airport are you talking about? Uh, Jordan, Jordanian airport. Oh, okay, yeah. So the one the transit airports on the way. Um, no, no, then we're gonna fly from Jordan. So okay. my, we're gonna go. So my Jordan is close. Uh, like if you go from here, you generally stop in Jordan, and then so it's transit for us. But yeah, so what happens is 
if you're just going from your home to the airport, one option is you shower at home, put everything on at home. You can even put the ihram on at home and then just go to the airport. If it's like within four or five hours, your journey, then that would make sense. Um, the other option would be to shower and get ready, but don't put your ihram on if you don't like traveling in ihram, carrying luggage, but keep your ihram in a bag. And then right. you're on the airplane, when you're getting close to the miqat, they will announce, okay, we are approaching the miqat. It's generally about 25 minutes before you land. So it's very close to Jeddah, but it's outside of Jeddah. So then they'll announce it in the airplane, and then everyone, you'll see a lot of people getting up and putting on their haram, the closed part, and then making the intention. So that's your personal choice. You can do it either way. So at the airport, when I wear the haram, I make the intention, right? And I pray to Rakaz. Yeah, then you can do it like that. Or you can do it that way, and then you're already in the state of ihram. Or you can put on the clothes and save your intention. That's another option until you get to the miqat. So you have everything on, but now necessarily, you're not necessarily in ihram. You just have the, the gear on. But when you get to the miqat at that point, that's where you uh, make the intention. It's it's probably better to make the intention in miqat. That's a sunnah anyway, when you're entering the boundary. Um, and then... The, but two rakahs will be very difficult on the plane. You could do it at your seat, but showering will be difficult and some of the other things will be difficult. So either way is okay. It's probably more preferred to put on your stuff, but don't make the intention until you reach the miqat or close to the miqat. And the second question is uh, for the for the sandals uh, you showed us, mm -hmm. can we wear the same one but, uh, covered on the toes? Yeah, so there's a difference of opinion. So... According to this hadith, the Prophet said, if you don't find sandals, then take your shoes and just cut the ankle part to make the shoes low. So based on that, many scholars say the shoes can be closed, just the ankles and part of the heel needs to be uncovered. So based on that opinion, you can have something that's covered. Mo a lot of scholars would disagree and say, no, we need part of the feet to be uncovered. That's what the sandals are. Um so you have to pick uh, what you're going to follow. Right. I believe the ankles, Sheikh Ala, who's a senior imam in our group, I asked him and his opinion was the ankles and the heels are the main thing, not the top of the feet or the toes. So even the shoe, if you have a regular shoe, just a regular shoe, you just collapse the back part. So your heel is exposed and your ankle is exposed and even that would be technically allowed. Okay. Just like a lakhat. Like a lakhat. Yeah, I have a question regarding uh, the two rak'ahs after the ihram. Uh, mm -hmm. I learned that it's um, it's it, it's like it's not a sunnah to do uh, to do a two rak'ahs, especially for the ihram, right? Yeah, so it's not one of the strong sunnahs, but uh, it's there are some scholars that do recommend it. Uh, so there's a difference of opinion on whether it's sunnah or not. Um, so Allahu Alam, there's a difference of opinion on that issue. Most people do it. Uh, most people recommend it, but um, there's some scholars who know it's the niya that's important in the prayer. Uh, mm -hmm. The the dua, sorry. By prayer, I meant dua. So you make intention, you make dua, um, but the rakars are not important. But I think majority of people, they do do the two rakars. So if you have the ability to do it, you should do it. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Go ahead. Uh, so I have a question. Like I'm uh, uh, going to Doha, so from Doha to Jeddah. Uh, so I intend to do. I have one hour in Doha layo layover. So uh, I think I plan to do uh, have take a shower from there. And then uh, do my uh, ihram. So I went to Google. Or I I search. I see they have uh, like maybe showers, you know, to, to paid showers. Mm -hmm. So is that confirmed? Can you confirm that for me, please? And uh, uh, if I do that, can I just take my ihram from there to do the turaka? And then uh, the turaka before ihram or you after do no. turaka after after ihram? Yeah. Okay, um, okay, so, I, yeah, okay. so I can't confirm the airport. I have no idea about the airport. But all these airports, they have haram facilities because it's a daily thing. People going for Umrah. So in, in Cairo, in Jordan, in Istanbul, all these places, 
they have the musallas and they have ihram musallas where there's a shower facility and then there's like place to make salah and put on your ihram. Especially in the season of Hajj, there'll be labels. So you will definitely find a place. The only problem you will have is one hour is not enough time. So if it's one hour you have to get from one terminal to the other to get to your next flight and one hour is like you just have to run, grab your stuff, come out of the plane, run to the next one and board. So there's literally not enough time. In Istanbul, when we were there for Umrah, we had about an hour and 20 minutes. We had no time for it. We ran. And even it was Ramadan, and I it was like half an hour till iftar. I did not have enough time to buy water or any food. And I even asked the guard, like, let me just go to the store, buy it. They said, no, 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 come in the flight right away. So one hour is very little time. Uh, you will miss your flight if you start showering and doing things like that. If you have two to three hours, then there's enough time. Again, I don't know Doha Airport, how big it is or how far everything is, but the most biggest priority for you is once you get out of your flight, go to the next leg of the flight, make sure you make it to the, the gate, and then just see the situation. Then if you have time, you find the close Masala and do what you can. But you should not be missing your flight just because you're showering or trying to do the two rakahs or things like that. So, just be so is this you, you recommend uh, like uh, uh, taking shower here, here and shower from like a watch? Yeah, with one hour, I don't think you'll have enough, honestly enough time to shower. So you shower before you get on the flight. And then over there in, in Doha, you just put on the ihram. So in Doha, you can, in the short time you have, you put on the ihram. Or you yeah. can put the ihram on in the, in the airplane too when you get on. Like you have about two hours, so you have about an hour. So in the airplane, you get on and then there you can put on the ihram if you like. You know, you're gonna to have to see the situation. Okay, last question is like I'm diabetic, so like about the food. Uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, I see like they posted here like electrolytes. You know, I absorb uh, drinks okay for diabetic person. So, um, this one, the one I buy, well, this one has like some sugar, but they have sugar-free electrolytes. So liquid IV makes sugar-free one. So if you're diabetic, you would buy the pack that's sugar-free. So that would be excellent for you. Um, so yeah, they have sugar-free versions of everything. Now, with that, let's talk about diabetes. Um, so diabetes yeah. is very, very common. Um, so, and diabetes is a is a complicated uh, process. There's different types of, some people have diabetes that really is, almost like not having diabetes or there's not a lot of things they have to change. Um, other people have diabetes that's controlled with injections. So it's very brittle, very serious, very severe. So with diabetes, you know, you have to have access to food all the time. Uh, if your sugar drops, that would be a problem. So most diabetics, they already know these things. Um, so diabetics generally have like snacks with them. So all diabetics, like the more severe diabetic, they should have in their possession, like nuts, um, you know, dried fruit, dates, dates are the best thing in case in all this exertion, your sugar drops and you don't have access to a meal. You put a date in your mouth and you'll be okay. So make sure you have access to things like that. Um, and eating like in these buffets, they will have like these donuts and pastries and the, the donuts and pastries are such low quality in, in unfortunately Makkah and Medina because they're mass produced. So they're even worse than the quality we have here. So a lot of people will have tea and coffee, put sugar in, and they have all these pastries that are just like nothing but white starch and white carbs. So that will make your sugar spike. So with, with diabetic, your sugar, the danger is going too high and the danger is going too low. For going too low, you just have dates and have something like healthy just to deal with that. But getting too high, try to avoid all these carbohydrates, have high... Um, white carbs try to go for like complex carbs like brown bread over white bread and things like that so you just have to manage yourself everyone is different diabetes is no one solution for everyone there are so many types of diabetes and every single person is different so you have to know yourself you should consult your own physician and come up with a plan some of these medications need to be adjusted like like in ramadan for instance where diabetic patients, we always, I always tell them to adjust their medications. There's some medication you eliminate. Same thing with Hajj. Hajj is kind of like Ramadan in the sense that um, it's a lot of exertion and you won't be able to eat on your own schedule. So if there's certain medications you take, some, some of them might need to be adjusted. 
Um, again, I can't tell you what to do. This is between you and your medical providers, but generally a lot of medicines have to be reduced when you're in this type of intense schedule. So if you're running around, your sugar is going to be lower than usual. You're going to be sweating a lot. You're going to be dehydrated. So if you're on these strong medications, your sugar might drop. So you have to be aware of that. You should consult your doctor, look at the regimen that you're on, what kind of medications you're on, um, and just see what can be adjusted, and and you have to know yourself. I'll be there in our groups, at least, um, inshallah, and with a um, glucose machine, and so I can help in any way I can, um, but everyone needs to be their own doctor. Everyone needs to take care of themselves and just be mindful of diabetes. There's so many things in diabetes that we need to be think about. But again, if you have specific questions uh, relating to diabetes, um, you can ask, inshallah. So if there's no question, then um, the other condition, the last condition I want to talk about is hypertension or high blood pressure. A lot of people do have high blood pressure and high blood pressure is, um, it's also different types. Like, um, so one of the dangers there is from um, running around overexertion, the blood pressure can get too high or it can get too low. Same thing like diabetes. So if it gets too low, you'll get dizzy and um, you might pass out. That can happen with dehydration. So you need to have electrolytes. That's very important in hydration. The other thing is running around and all the tension that's involved and all the things that can go wrong, they do go wrong and more than that. So there's a lot of stress and tension in Hajj. That's part of Hajj. And that for many people with high blood pressure, it causes the blood pressure to go up and can be so high that can cause... Um, God as forgive. Assalamu alaikum. Yes. There, there is a cap, uh, I mean, salt cap, uh, capsule. It is okay for the uh, electrolyte? There's a what? The, the, it's the salt, uh, what is that? Salt capsule? I mean, ca yeah, salt so it, stick capsule. I don't know what you mean by salt that? capsule, but it's probably the same thing like these. Like these are electrolytes. It probably yeah. comes in capsule form. So those are electrolytes for hydration. So is it, is that okay? To, uh -huh. Well, I can't tell you it's okay, but if you're for really bad people with very high blood pressure, they have to, or heart failure, for instance, you can't have salt or hydro, uh, electrolytes in you. So you have to be careful. So if you have heart condition like heart failure or very, very bad blood pressure, like you're on three or four medications, then you have to be careful about these things. For everyone else, normal people or people with just like mild blood pressure that's mostly controlled, maybe they're on one medication, then it should be okay. It really depends. Everyone's individual. I can just give you general guidelines here. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So that's blood pressure, diabetes, and then we talked about the skin, the, or the hydration, skin care. So those are things that came to my mind. The last thing, the final thing I want to talk about is infections, infections, okay? So um, most people or many people get throat infection. They get cough with mucus. They get these types of infections. Um, and the reason for that is it's complicated, but it's so many people there. So, so many people, they have germs, one person coughing, it spreads to everyone else. So there's transmission from person to person. The second is you're dehydrated, you're not drinking enough water, you're overexerting, not getting enough rest. So your immune system is low. So those two combinations, the, the germs that are around you, the immune system being not as optimal state, and then also um, um the hot environment, then the AC. The One of the worst things is um, they blast the AC inside the massage. It's sometimes so cold and bad, you want to wear a jacket. When you come outside, it's 105 degrees. So hot to cold and hot to cold, that does like, you know, like does a lot of things to your body. So all of these factors cause a lot of infections. So, you know, you should, if you can, visit your doctor, try to get some antibiotics with you. Everyone is different. You have to see what kind of infections you're prone to. Some people get a lot of sore throat, throat infections. Some people get bronchitis. If you have asthma or COPD, you'll get like chest infections. And you, everyone has a different type of antibiotic that works for them. So visit your doctor. Try to get a prescription of an antibiotic if you can. 
if you can and it's too late, no big problem. Uh, the good thing there, I need to let everyone know, is that there's very good medical care in the kingdom, especially in Hajj. So there are clinics everywhere. There are doctors everywhere. There are pharmacies everywhere. Anything you need, if you don't have it with you, you can find it. You can go there. You can buy a wheelchair. You can buy, like, knee braces, things like that. If you have a sprain, you can get antibiotics. You just have to visit one of the pharmacies or one of the clinics. And generally, most of them in Hajj are covered. They're free. The only problem is long lines. So we don't know how it'll be this year, but generally there are long lines. So, you know, um, don't worry too much. There are always access to facilities and hospitals. and They're happy to help you. Just it will take time. So if you can do some things on your own, bring your own antibiotic, it will save some time uh, for your on your behalf. What are good antibiotics? Azithromycin or z -Pak. Azithromycin is a good antibiotic generally for sore throats. So that's a good idea to have with you. Um, but it could be amoxicillin. It could be, there's a lot of different options. You can see, you know, depending on your condition, what your doctor prescribes. Also take some painkillers with you, um, either ibuprofen or Tylenol, which is acetaminophen. One of the two, just in case you have a sprain, you have a sprained ankle, uh, God forbid you fall or something like that. It's good to have some painkillers to use periodically. Also, if you have stomach conditions, like if you get a lot of diarrhea from nervousness or travel, take diarrhea medicine, um, like Lomatil or Imodium or something like that. Most of these are over-the-counter. If you have a lot of allergies and sneezing and stuff like that, then take allergy medicine with you. So take a supply of small supply of medication. Don't overpack. Don't bring a lot because everything is available there, but take a small supply with you. Uh, maybe have a first aid kit. Uh, if you can have a small first aid kit that has bandages, alcohol swabs, things like that, just in case you need it, that also is a good idea. But again, do not overpack. Don't make it a huge part of your luggage. That just uh, makes things harder. Uh, but have a small supply with you. That does make sense. Finally, the infection I forgot to mention. Uh, with infections, the mask. So you are allowed to wear the medical mask in a haram. Normally it's not allowed, but... If if you're coughing or you're you're vulnerable and you have like a low immune system, you have chronic medical conditions, then whenever you get in crowds, you should wear the mask to protect yourself. That's an option for those vulnerable patients. Uh, normal people don't need to do that. If you choose to do that, you want to protect yourself. Does it really do anything? Um, as a doctor, I can't say 100%. Everyone still gets sick even with the mask. Uh, but it does. It is like one barrier. So it is. It does make sense that it would prevent some things from getting close to you. So it had some level of protection. It's not absolute. In the end of the day, no matter what you do, you will overexert yourself. Uh, many of us will get sick. Um, but inshallah, let's try our best to prevent all of that as much as we can, and make dua to Allah to protect all of us and give us healing. And and inshallah, there are people there to help. In Hajj, one of the good things is. Everyone is in the mode to help. So in Umrah, it's not necessarily like in Hajj. The entire kingdom transforms. Even the locals there are trying to help. They're trying to uh, give out things. You walk in the street, people will be giving out water bottles. People will bring like a truck and just give out food. And so it's an environment of brotherhood. And alhamdulillah, I still like that every time I go. So rest assured that you are in good hands and Allah Azza wa Jal, if you're doing things for his sake, this is a journey just for Allah. Allah will take care of all of us, inshallah. So that's what I wanted to say. And with that, I can open the floor for more questions if anyone has. Um, Amina Hajar, if, yes, if you can ask your question. My question is about the Sahati app. Um, what is it that people have to do on it we downloaded it but it doesn't seem to be so working think properly my, my feeling is that we're not supposed to do that so i'm not sure i also downloaded it and it doesn't allow me to register so ignore it take your okay. vaccine certificate with you if it was something okay. required i think we okay. would have known a lot earlier than just like a day before so oh, and it you... may be i think dr i should say it may be something only for the locals there so don't worry about that. Just have the certificates okay. with you when you travel. And do any of the certificates need to be stamped by doctors? No, they just need to look like certificates. And, okay. you know, they're just like with millions of people, they're just looking for a certificate. And um, 
you know, they're different. There are no absolute mm -hmm. requirement that has to have this way or that way. So. Yellow fever. How important is yellow fever? And how important is the yellow fever vaccine? The yellow fever is not something we ever do here in the U.S., from the U.S. anyway. Uh, it's not a big concern in, in Saudi Arabia. Again, with vaccines, it's an individual decision. It's all up to your philosophy, what you're trying to do. Are you trying to get maximum protection? Do you believe that they work? Um, mm -hmm. The only thing absolutely required is uh, the the meningitis, because I think there were 12 cases of meningitis recently there. So the meningitis has been required traditionally and is still required. Everything else is optional. So um, one approach is just tawakkar al Allah, you know, like just take your precautions and trust in Allah. Another approach is try to do as much as you can by taking vaccines. I don't know. I can't tell you what approach is better. Um, but I, I'm more inclined towards just doing what's required and then taking your precautions. Um, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? No, uh, no. Quick question. Uh, during the Mashar days in uh, Mina and Arafat, do you which food we should avoid? Which food do you recommend that we should not uh, avoid? Like yeah. So... Um, Good question. I mean, so processed carbohydrates are very bad. What happens is when you eat, so that's what they give in breakfast, unfortunately, everywhere. So you have tea and coffee, you have all these pastries with like, you know, like sugar on them. And so what happens with those are like, you know, you get a boost of energy, but then you crash. So when you eat processed carbohydrates, like pastries, donuts and cakes and things like that, you know, like after one to two hours, most people crash, you get very sleepy and you lose your energy. So that's not going to give you energy to sustain yourself. So try to avoid those to a minimum, like processed carbohydrates. Other than that, try to have, you know, more protein. Protein is very, very important. I didn't mention that, but they sell protein powder. It's hard to carry. It's so big. But protein is so important. Like if you have more protein in your diet, hard to do when the options are limited. But you can take the powder with you, protein powder, and try to mix it in water, drink it every day. That will give you so much energy and but if you want to do it through the food, focus on like the lentil. Lentil soup is excellent. They usually have that in a lot of options. Um, the vegetables, try to get like vegetables stew, stew and things like that. Meats, you can have meat like uh, red meat or chicken or fish. They'll definitely have those options. Focus more on the protein sources rather than the carbohydrate. Carbohydrate is pastries, bread and rice. That should be very minimum. If you do it like that, you'll have so much more energy. And the general rule is the more processed the food is, the worse it is. The more natural the food is, closer to the way Allah created it, like fitra. That's such. So if you have vegetables and they're all bright green and red, they're good. If you cook them and, and then put curry in them, they all turn into this like blazing fire red. So if you see curry, it's all like, like lava, like a volcano. Those things are so processed, that's not that wholesome for you. So Allah said... Um, he asks us to eat the stuff that is halal and tayyiba in the Quran. Halal meaning it's permissible, tayyiba meaning wholesome. So that means like, you know, it should be wholesome. Like, so less processed, better. The less the processed food it is, the more it looks like the original form of the food, the better it is. So try to avoid oily stuff, try to avoid carbohydrates, try to avoid processed foods. Um, you can have some of it, but like, don't make the plate entirely carbohydrate and a little bit of meat. Have more protein, more vegetables, more salad, and a little bit of rice, a little bit of uh, bread. Um, Allah Ta'ala Alam. Any final questions? Any questions relating to medications, specific medications that people take? If you have specific medications. Uh, uh, right there. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, just a quick question regarding the uh, sunscreen. Do you have a specific rating or recommendation, like SPF? No, I I personally don't use sunscreen. Like, but uh, the it's supposed to be seventy and above is a good one. Seventy has the highest protection. Like, it should be like rated seventy or above, whatever brand you buy, that gives you the most protection. Yeah. Inshallah. Okay, thank you. The good thing about like sunburn, I don't see a lot of it in in Hajj and Umar for some reason. Even though the sun is so intense, there's something about the environment, subhanAllah. It's not humid. And um, generally, people don't run into trouble. When you go to like 
Like there's more sunscreen that happens in Florida than than in Mecca and Medina for some reason. So it's not a huge problem, but if you have just like a small bottle, that would help inshallah. We can use the sunscreen on the uh, ihram? Yeah, um, as long as oh. uh, so sunscreen generally doesn't have a scent. Uh, and even if it has a slight scent, that's not an issue. Issue would be something with like that's perfumed and like that has is made designed for like perfume purposes. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, so uh, I wanna ask a question about like uh, lip balms, so or uh, chapsticks. Uh, lip it's balm a... and chapstick. Yeah, that would be like Vaseline. So Vaseline is lip balm, basically. So they have smaller version of these you put on your lips to prevent dry lips. That would be okay. Um, the only issue with these, possibly for some scholars, would be when you make wudu. If it's like giving you a full barrier, then the water is not reaching the skin. That would be the only fiqh issue with some of these. So what I would recommend is just put them on, and then when you have time to make wudu, wash them all. Then, and then that way you'll get the full washing, and then put them on again. So you get out of that ikhtilaf. Uh, okay, that's for the lips. I think it's uh, maybe dry out, and then you, you don't even see it. So uh, yeah, well, still have... most of them, they don't. If you put something very thick, like some of them, I don't know, there's so many products out there. There may be some products that are water insoluble so that they give you a barrier and then the water doesn't reach. So generally, if you have something on after two, three hours, most of it is going to be gone. It'll be drying up. So the next time you have to make wudu, you should be okay. But just you have to be careful. It's an issue you have to be mindful of. Maybe the product you use is so thick, like, like nail polish. That's why women don't use nail polish um, when they're praying because... Nail polish prevents water from reaching the nail. So this is not like nail polish, but maybe there's a product someone has that's very close, is very thick. So, Allah uh, Alam. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? So, Salam uh, Alaikum. Like Samra. Yeah, yeah. So, so just to clarify something, um, like while in the while we are in the ihram, it's okay, like to use the regular soap, like to wash our things, or or or, or, or to so, wash. Our there's no, there's no um restriction of soap. The restriction is of scents, the, the yes. scents. So this, so perfumes and scents. So, um, based on that, some scholars, the, so suppose you have dove, something has a little bit of a smell. So yeah. some scholars will say, no, it's okay because that's not really perfume. It's just part of the smell of the soap. There's mm -hmm. something minor that they put in, it would be okay. But others will say, no, to be safe, uh, you can use unscented soap. A lot of the soap is unscented. You can find unscented soap that has no perfume. Uh, there's no scent. that has no smell. So, But soap itself is not an issue at all. It would just be that the level of scent or perfume or smell that it has. Okay. Okay, is there, let me pull up the chat. I didn't look at the chat yet. What are recommended colors for women to wear in a haram? So women's a haram is so easy. Sometimes that's one I get so jealous. But women they don't have to do anything. They just go there, they make intention. Everything is normal. They can wear their normal clothes. Um, so for ihram, there's no requirement for a color. Just the normal rules of modesty apply to women. You know, you don't, you, like, it's not part of haya modesty to have very bright colors that people can see from far away to attract attention. So, but beyond that, there's no specific color that you have to wear. Um, I know a lot of people wear black, um, but from a medical perspective, black puts heat into you, like, like it attracts more heat, absorbs heat. So maybe white is a better option or a lighter color so that the light bounces off you and there's less heat problems. But there's no restrictions on colors, generally speaking. Can we use alcohol-based hand sanitizer on ihram? If not, what other hand sanitizer would you recommend? Yes, that alcohol is not the, the alcohol that's forbidden. Alcohol is just a chemical product. Anytime you have a hydroxyl group to any chemical, it becomes an alcohol that's not khamar, Allah forbade. Khamar, khamar is a specific type of ethyl alcohol that's produced for intoxicating purposes from 
grapes or wheat or food sources. So that's not rubbing alcohol. So that's something very different. Rubbing alcohol is isopropyl alcohol. So there's no problem with that. So you can use that. The shoe, so I, we talked about that in the beginning. So you need to watch that video on our group. Uh, if you're in part of our group, the shoes, uh, um, we have a whole discussion on shoes and I show you some like different options, inshallah. Any other questions? Okay, so it is June 1st. I think most people are coming, are going in the next few days. Some people, the very first people have already gone, I think today or yesterday. So over the next few days, people are traveling. So um, there's a lot of different flights that are going to Hajj, a lot of different arrival dates. So, you know, just be mindful of that. We have a large group. It's under a larger company. So it's hard to, like, predict who you're going to be with and, um, I just got my flight information recently, just two days ago. Now I know where I'm going and when I'm going. But everywhere you go, you'll be taken care of. Like at the airport, you need to just find the Rawaf Mina uh, table, go there, register, and they'll take you by hand and they'll just uh, arrange everything. In the hotel, things will be taken care of. So just don't worry too much about these things. And just be mindful that Hajj is a massive, massive undertaking with millions of people in one place and anything that can go wrong does go wrong so keep that in mind a lot of people are already getting upset about these things i'll tell you every time i've been to hajj some major disaster happens so this is part of what hajj is and that's why allah gave you the reward of hajj do you think allah gave you such a big reward that you just it's like you just were born from your mother that day everything wiped out you start fresh in your life Starting fresh in your life is not going to come easy. It's going to come with hardships. And part of Hajj is the hardships of Hajj. So there are difficulties and hardships. So keep that in mind. You're going there is a jihad. That's why the Prophet called it a jihad for women. It's just like fighting on the front lines, but for, for the women. So it's very similar to jihad. So be aware of that and let's be all be patient. I reminded another brother. Let's not lose our tempers. Let's not argue there. You will lose the reward of Hajj. Imagine you go there and something goes wrong and there's a logistical errors and you weren't able to get what you promised and then you get into a fight. So just because of some like logistical error, you lose the whole reward of Hajj and you didn't get the reward of Hajj, that amazing, amazing reward of Hajj. Like no one loses in that situation but yourself or myself. So let's just be mindful of that. Let's keep our tempers uh, under control. Let's be patient. That's why... Allah says in Hajj, In Hajj, no rafath is the rules of ihram, not being close with your wives, uh, having the relations. Fusuq, any type of sin. And jidal, any type of arguing. So let's not argue. Let's be very patient. Be silent. Be patient. Things will work out. Just follow the crowd and you'll have your Hajj. There's not a whole lot of things you have to concern. Everywhere everyone is going, you just follow them. And things will work out. There's plenty of people go there without any prep. They just go there, follow the crowd, and the hajj is, is done. But just prepare yourself spiritually and mentally, inshallah. It should be okay. And be very patient with each other. Um, and inshallah, um, you put your trust in Allah. Tawakkul on Allah. Put your trust in Allah, and Allah will take care of you. If you put your trust in all the preparations and the asbab and all the this and that, you will be disappointed. So let's have that mindset, and inshallah, may Allah bless all of your preparations. May Allah give you all a safe journey, and may you all reach there safely. You may, may all of us have a safe and beneficial and blessed hajj, and I hope to see many of you there soon, inshallah. inshallah. So with that, um, let's make dua for each other. Uh, I'll make dua for me too. So, yes, brother. Yes, brother. Was there a question, brother? Hello, assalamu alaikum, brother. Actually, me and my wife going on uh, uh, June June tenth, inshallah. Okay. But I have a question about the health. You know, the some medicine we have we take, like I take um uh, one cholesterol medicine and uh, blood pressure, like a low dose, and uh, those I have to take every day, so I can carry with my backpack, right? 
Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. and, and and my wife, uh, she taking, uh, she has a lung cancer. She taking capsule and tablet with the Tegreso and the Capra. Capra for the Caesar okay. and Tegreso for the cancer. But she's doing fine. She's okay. So this medicine is going to be any problem with the hot weather, like a temperature wise? Because... I don't think so, but the Capra, like the seizure is like when you're stressed, your body's stressed, sometimes it can precipitate seizures. So you have to be careful about the seizure part. So yeah. try to have her like not walk, exert herself, take the buses, uh -huh. try to have her in like the cold environment and not be in the sun too much, as much right. as you can. Maybe yeah. when the, in the Jamarat, like when you stone, uh -huh. you can do on her behalf, let her stay in the tent and you take her stones and do it on her behalf. So she's not uh -huh. walking like 45 minutes in the sun. And, okay. uh, so for her, if it's with the cancer situation, the seizure situation, uh -huh. you should be more uh -huh. careful and let yes. her let her rest and do some of the things on her behalf. And the tawaf, maybe she can use a wheelchair or uh, the services they have with the scooters. Uh, physically, she's uh, strong. She's okay because yeah. we went to Umrah a couple of years ago. She okay. she was doing so well over there, you know. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. She, she don't even feel anything, you know. She was very very healthy woman, you know. Uh, so, but this time still she's okay. But uh, we just uh, have to little push on the Arafat and the Musdalifa Mina, you know, because it's a uh, hot weather. And plus, yeah. we have to walk a lot, you know. Yeah, you have to. Pay, you, just, you should try to pick and choose what you want to do. Like the some yeah, people prefer exactly. tawaf is the greatest, one of the greatest acts of worship. So if you have to, like, you're not absolutely required to use a wheelchair, but you will. So maybe you do the tawaf by foot and use the wheelchair for the sari in Safa and Marwa because that's longer and there's exactly. more reward in the tawaf. So you have to pick and choose exactly. what you want to do and what you want to where you want to rest. So you can think about things like that. And then okay. Jamarat also, maybe you can do on behalf. But Tawaf is so special. If you have energy, try to do it on foot. Try to do it, uh, you know, especially yeah, if you get time, into last, the time she did, last time she did on the, the Umrah, you know, she has, uh, she, 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 uh, like I said, she's healthy woman, you know, so far, inshallah. You know, Allah bless her. Uh, Allah protect all of you. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, inshallah, yeah. it should be okay. Be inshallah. Years, but she should be fine. But the Mina and the uh, Zamarat and the Muzdalifa, do stuff. Uh, any uh, transportation for her, like a kind of uh, because it's quite a walk. yeah. There's, there's transportation for everyone. They're not asking people to walk. There's transportation okay. for everyone. Alhamdulillah. Okay. The only the only major issue would be, I guess, at the end of everything. After you do the Jamarat on the first day, the tenth, and then you do the stoning, you have to do the Tawaf, Tawaf al the, the main Tawaf of Hajj. Uh -huh. That will be a challenge because <clears throat> all three million people are right. trying to do that, or wherever how many million people are there, and then everyone's going at the same time. So there, you need to like try to find proper transportation for her because it's a long walk. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Okay, but they have available there, right? Transportation. Yeah. There'll be yeah, there. plenty of transportation, just different options, different prices. Different but that's the only part that the group is not arranging. Everything else, we have our own buses, nothing to worry okay. about. But at the end, when you have to go to Mecca to do the tawaf, uh -huh. and there it will be a problem. So one option you have, you don't have to do it the same day. You can go back oh, to okay. Mina through our transportation, rest, and do the next day when there's less crowd. She can do it oh, like okay. that too. Because that's the yeah, maximum yeah. crowd yeah. is on that day. So you can delay okay. it to that night or the next day, inshallah. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much, brother. You're welcome. Any, anyone else? Final questions? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. So you can delay the tawaf? Yes. Uh, I mean, ideally, the sunnah is to do it after the, the, the hadi, the sacrifice on that day. But yeah, you can delay it because... If that day is too crowded and if we decided to stay in Mina and come back uh, next day do Tawaf, it will be okay? Yeah, it, could be, it will be okay. Uh, it's just, uh, it's hard because you, you need to come out of Ihram. That's one factor. You have to stay in Ihram one more day. So that's an issue. But yes, you can. Um, there are some people that do it at night. Some people do it the next day. But majority of people do it that day because that's, that's the Sunnah. But you can delay it. Okay. Jazakallah.
Anyone okay. else? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, hello. Yes, go ahead, brother. Yeah, my, my question is the same is like the end of Zul Hijjah, when we are the like uh, the hadith done and uh, you shave your head. Uh, after that, you take uh, take a shower, then you take off the the ihram, right? So, do we have to use the ihram to do the tawaf, or without the ihram, we can do the tawaf? That's a complicated question. Um, generally, you're in the ihram and you take it out after you do after you finish two of the three rites. But suppose you do. Technically, like if you do the jamarat, you do the the sacrifice, and you cut your hair, then three of the things are done. Then technically, come out of ihram and do it. But majority of people do it in the ihram, so because you don't know like when the hadi sacrifice is done and things like that. So that's a little complicated situation. We will consult like some of the senior scholars there to see what they suggest. You know. Okay, actually, this is uh, my confusion. The, I've been asking the, so many people. They said, no, you have to go with the Aram. And some, some people say, the, no, once you're done uh, for uh, everything, you cut your hair, then uh, the, you take off the Aram, then you can go the regular dress to do the Tawaf. So that really... I, mean, I don't have to, I have to look into that more, inshallah. Okay, thank really you very much. Good question. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Because some people do the like uh, the two days later or the next day. So the, because there's two the exits from yeah, there's the halal asghar and akbar. So there's a you come out of ihram, the minor coming out of ihram. I think you can put your clothes on there. Then then there's a major coming where now everything is allowed. So I believe you can put on your regular clothes. Allah, that's my understanding. But we'll, we'll, okay, okay, no problem. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Muhammad Ismail, I think he has a question. Yeah. Anyone else have a question? Okay, then let's conclude then, inshallah. Hope to see you all uh, soon and make dua for me, make dua for each other, and inshallah, you'll have a great and wonderful Hajj. May Allah accept it from all of us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Mm -hmm.